course, had the glass caught right under the window. And every night, the searchlight went on and shook her feet and had fancy things like curtains. So the light would shine over my face every so many minutes. And it was very hard to go to sleep. And since my, again, my thought was right under the window, and no curtains, it was difficult to go to sleep. And I don't know how other children manage, but it was very hard. For me, I think for the, one of the crucial um, threads of my, the movie that we made was the use of propaganda films that kind of wove itself into, into the film. And I thought that that was a very important element. Um, it was interesting, when, I mean, this film was like eight years old when I was getting this app into the Japanese American, and I was trying to introduce this into the Japanese American community. I got some pushback from, um, from a certain community <laughs> who really um, didn't want to show the film because of the propaganda films. And they, they were concerned that people might actually, their takeaway might be that, that, they, that somebody would walk away believing the propaganda. Um, but I thought that that was such a critical element of, of, of the movie because it did show just the version of how the U.S. government, I mean, in your exhibit, you have the move, you have the, uh, in the Salinas racetrack, if you haven't seen it, it's just very, it's a very powerful um, piece of footage whereby the government propaganda, where the U.S. government actually staged a propaganda film, um, whereby people had to um, stage scenes of happy domesticity within the racetracks. Um, so I just thought that the propaganda was a very important piece to include in the film. And I, and I think that, um, you know, the point of taking away someone's dignity, that was something that resonated very, very powerfully with me in that, um, you know, while we're, you know, having somebody, your mother, gave birth in a racetrack, you know, in a, in a horse stall, in a horse stall. I mean, the mode of transport, getting people from the um, from the trains in Parker, you know, once they arrived at the uh, in Arizona, they didn't they didn't exactly take find buses. <laughs> it was open, you know, it was open, you know, open um, whatever they call it, military, military transport, where people had to be, you know, hanging on to the sides, you know, for fear of falling on set of you know, had its own narrative, and I think when one of the dangers of comparing the two is that you do open it up to like, oh, well, they didn't have it so bad. Well, that's not really. Yes, they did, <laughs> but in a, in a in a very different in a very different way. I do recall films and TV films, watching films, watching movies. Yeah, all right. And uh, they used to, in count three anyway. Uh, yeah, it's right, uh, Thursday night. Was it Thursday night for you? Oh, I'm on Tuesday, count two. Wednesday, you guys got it. Thursday. <laughs> well, I don't remember the date, it's that date, but um, we would see movies like V is for Victory, mm -hmm. Van <laughs> Johnson, and all of those. Uh, Starts with Popeye cartoons. And oh, uh, Popeye cartoons. And um, can't spinach. Remember can't spinach? <laughs> well, they served can't spinach once in the, in the in camp. And I was so excited, we're going to have can't spinach. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the most god awful thing I've ever <laughs> tasted. I used to put them up. Oh, But an uh, emperor. Uh, Flashboard, okay, a serial, about 15 minutes, okay, and then he would, there would be an explosion, and somehow the next week he'd escape. And, he, and the bad guy was who? Emperor Ming. Emperor Ming, yeah, Asian. Uh, and then we'd see how he was so I don't remember a game. The only thing I remember was the Americans were bombing the gas and um, just 
just seen
ship with no facilities, and I think it was worse than being in Costa as far as uh, the ship we were concerned, because we couldn't, well, to go to the bathroom, we had to get permission from the people who were living in our house if we could borrow the bathroom or you know, do whatever. It was pretty miserable there for a month before we were able to get back into the Costa. Just think of the logistics, like eat misses. There was no internet. There was no, I mean, just, so, I mean, just take the story of Keo in the movie when she talks about um, her whole family um, situation. Um, she was sort of sent back to Sacramento area to see what had happened to the family home before the family actually went out there. So if you were to just start doing the math, the logistics, it takes time for her to go back <laughs> To, you know, to figure out what's going on, to then relay word to the parents, and then, so, it was logistically, it took some time for people just to gather their wits about them and to figure out what, you know, what happened, what happened to the family business, and if I go back to a certain, if I go back home, how do I support myself, what are my options, where do I go, how do I support a family? Um, so, it wasn't just, I think, it wasn't just as easy as, oh, you know, I, I, I can leave. There, had, there were some, um, there was some planning, some logistics that were involved that that did take time. Okay, next question. question. Yeah, with, uh, with, with Roosevelt, Roosevelt's plan they were carried out. Oh, the assimilation. Uh, they didn't want to take over. They were um, cutting back into the school system. I finished kindergarten before I went to Boston. So I was in the first, second, third grade, and they were not prepared for us school kids. And there are pictures, if you go into the archives, of kids sitting on the dirt with their teacher until they were able to, first of all, use the internally the males who could hammer chairs for kids and tables. And uh, so they, they just weren't prepared for the school or for kids to, to enter these camps. And uh, I remember my father making a chair for me. Uh, and anyway, it was, it was pretty interesting how they had to rush them out to get ready for all these school kids and um, have places for them. And teachers. Teachers was a problem. This was my classroom, okay? Our adults made stools for us, and then we went to school like this. And we sat down, okay, teacher, teach. We didn't have books, paper, pencils. We didn't have qualified teachers. We had volunteers. California finally sent us books. And John Shigemoto was so excited because he looked at this book, and it's from E.A. Hall, Watsonville Middle School. And when he opened it up and it said, Issue 2, it was issued to his older sister. And he was so excited. I finally got it. I didn't really have second and third grade. I had a fourth grade teacher, Miss Cooper. We didn't smell too good, okay, because of you know, that. We wore the same clothes day in, day out. Okay? So I raised sweet peas. Gave it to her, she would wear the sweet peas here, so when she bent down to help the student, she would smell the sweet peas until I caught up. She didn't have to do that. But one thing the Japanese American community owes is the teachers were among the best friends we had during, before and during and after the war. One of the reasons why I became a school teacher was to pay a debt that the Japanese American community owes to the public school teachers. Yes? These public school teachers, uh, white or Japanese or what? Oh, Ms. Cooper was a Quaker from Pennsylvania. And the other volunteer teachers before, before she came were from camp, were they interning? A lot were 
lot of Japanese college students who had some training but very little, and they were sort of drafted into becoming teachers. The pay, well, okay. the highest pay was $19 for doctors, dentists, professionals. See, a soldier made $21, a private made $21. At the end of the war, he made $50, but our pay remained the same. My mother was an assistant cook. She got $12, $16 a month. The lowest pay was $12. My mother worked 10 hours a day. She worked for five cents an hour. But we needed the money, you know why? We didn't sell our house. What does that mean? We have to pay taxes. Otherwise, we would lose the house to foreclosure. How would you pay taxes from the concentration? By friends. Our house, okay, we gave it the keys to uh, Stacy Irwin, who was an attorney. So she looked out after the house. When we got back, the weeds were growing all over the place. And the hobo was living not in the house, in the back seat of the car in the garage. And when he saw us, he took off. And we took off after him. Why? We wanted to catch him, to thank him, because he was a caretaker of the house. We never caught up with him. We were so lucky. We also, okay, our people read the local newspaper. We had it mailed to us in camp. The defense council voted 15 to 3 not to welcome us back not to welcome us back. We knew there was some strong feelings, but we didn't really care about the 15. We wanted to know who in the hell are the three? <laughs> because the, those were the people who were our friends, to whom we were deeply indebted. And how were you able to have enough money to pay for your property taxes? Okay, my brothers in the Army, he sent half the paychecks home. But one of them even bought me a $25 war bond. That cost $18.50. When we were in school on Thursdays, we took our little dimes, Nicholson dimes, and we went to school and we gave them to the teacher who gave us little stamps that we could put into our stamp book. When we had $18.75 worth of stamp, we could trade it in for a war bond. Ten years later, we could cash the war bond for $25. That $25 is not going to buy as much as $18.75 did ten years earlier. But we were trying to do a war bond.